Welcome everyone to the Center for Law and Economics Vlog and Podcast Series. I'm Naman Goyal and it's a great honor that today we have with us Professor Alessandro Acquisti from Carnegie Mellon University. We will be talking to him about his recent paper, Secrets and Likes, The Drive for Privacy and the Difficulty of Achieving It in the Digital Age. Welcome Professor Acquisti. Hi, it's a pleasure talking to you. So we often hear disturbing news about violation of users' privacy on online platforms. Still, the popularity of these platforms continues to grow and users continue to increasingly share their personal data online. This raises the questions whether users actually care about their online privacy and what are the factors influencing users' desires and users' ability to protect their privacy. So, Professor Akisti, before we dive deeper into the paper, can you please summarize for our viewers and listeners what are the core contributions of this paper? These, uh, uh, this paper uh, attempts to draw connections between uh, uh, streams of uh, economic and behavior research on privacy, um, spanning over two decades to derive uh, implications for public policy. Um, one of the uh, um, arguments we consider in in the manuscript is indeed the extent uh, to which individuals actually uh, care for privacy uh, or not. And our uh, our conclusion, based on uh, the analysis of uh, existing research uh, by uh, not just our own team uh, but many others, is that. Uh, contrary to the common assertion that consumers do not care for privacy, there is in fact extensive empirical evidence of people caring deeply and, and taking action to protect their privacy, but there is also evidence of uh, significant economic, uh, behavioral, technological hurdles that also prevent individuals from achieving uh, the levels of privacy that they desire. And uh, given the existence of these barriers or these hurdles, uh, we conclude in the paper that policy intervention interventions are the, uh, in our view, the only viable approach to privacy protection. We can we can use privacy enhancing technologies. We can use uh, um, data propertization schemes. We can use nudges and behavior interventions. But at the end of the day, uh, we do not feel that any of these uh, uh, tools uh, in isolation from regulatory intervention can truly be effective if the general goal and aim is uh, allowing individuals to manage their privacy online. Yeah, uh, so I think we can all agree that when low cost privacy preserving tools are available, uh, users would be willing to use them to protect their privacy. Uh, but uh, the question is to what extent people care about their online privacy and there must be lots of variables that play a role here. For example, the cost of these tools in terms of the time and effort it takes to use these tools, uh, the nature and, and the sensitivity of the information being shared, uh, the potential harm that that information can cause and the level of trust on the service provider. So isn't this a very complex research question? And is it even possible to come up with a general answer to this question? You, you, you are exactly correct. Uh, it is a, a very complex research question and personally I do not believe that it is possible to come up with a general answer. Uh, if by general answer we, uh, we uh, refer to a, uh, a simple encapsulation, a, a formula so to say, uh, with uh, four or five key elements that once uh, filled with the correct value can uh, um, accurately uh, predict uh, uh, any um, random consumer future behavior when it comes to privacy. Uh, that does not mean, however, in my view, uh, that we, we cannot uh, extract some uh, uh, general and generalizable uh, patterns. Um, uh, keeping in mind, however, that 
um, privacy trade-offs and therefore privacy behavior are uh, always context dependent. They are extremely nuanced, they're contextual. Uh, and so um, multiple factors and processes may uh, be playing simultaneously a role and sometimes even contradictory roles in influencing or determining a choice or decision making. Um, for instance, um, the it is uh, quite clear to me nowadays that we cannot conceive of privacy uh, a choice solely as a process of uh, uh, rational deliberation, uh, the so-called uh, privacy calculus, the calculus of trade-offs, the cost and benefits associated with uh, protecting and sharing data, or solely as a result of purely uh, emotional um, uh, influences, um, fear, desire to share, uh, fear of consequences of sharing, etc. It, it, it seems clear to me that the um, our ultimate uh, choices and behaviors when it comes to privacy are a combination of what in the literature has been indeed referred to as a privacy calculus, as well as the uh, the influence of uh, behavioral factors, including uh, uh, biases and heuristics, which are the ones that my uh, much of my research has focused on. And fr from, from the uh, complex interaction between both factors, rational considerations and more behavioral influences, from this combination, be, uh, choices uh, emerge. So, for instance, in the manuscript, we try to provide evidence both of uh, um, privacy-seeking behavior offline and online across uh, surveys, field experiments, uh, field observations, lab experiments, etc. But also, we provide evidence of a clear desire for people to share, um, sometimes with, just with friends, sometimes with strangers. And, and, and the way to reconcile these two sets of evidence, the, the evidence of privacy-seeking behavior and the evidence of uh, disclosure-seeking behavior, is uh, that, first of all, uh, using and uh, referring to um, Irwin Altman's work on, on privacy, both protection and disclosure uh, or sharing, uh, limiting, the access of yourself to others and allowing others to access yourself are drives of human nature which are in tension but not in contradiction. We all have them. There are moments and situations where we want more protection, more hiding, more solitude, and situations where we want more disclosure, more sharing, more interaction, more sociali uh, so uh, socialization with others. And this is very normal. So we, if we understand that privacy is not about blocking data flows or always protecting, but rather, as Irwin Altman pointed out over 40 years ago, it is rather a process, a dynamic process of boundary regulation, which is dynamic and dialectic. So alternates between opening and sharing, uh, sorry, uh, protecting and sharing, opening and closing, um, uh, and, and, and it is context dependent. If we understand that, then we can make sense of much of these uh, seemingly initially contradictory uh, empirical evidence. That said, as I mentioned earlier, there can be significant hurdles that people face in engaging in uh, what Irwin Altman described as this dynamic process of boundary regulation, because there are sometimes factors of economic nature, of behavioral nature, or technological nature, that make it hard for people to achieve their uh, desire levels of privacy. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we, 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 we discuss in the manuscript how uh, desire privacy may often not translate to achieve the privacy, precisely because of these problems.
okay so according to you what are the three most dominant behavioral or psychological factors that affect privacy decision making and uh, can you give us some example where firms exploit these in their favor uh, and do you think that this is unethical in nature so sure let's discuss first what the factors may be and then whether and how and 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 and, and when uh, organizations may exploit them and, and whether that is inherently uh, ethically uh, uh, troublesome uh, or not. So um, to list uh, three factors, uh, information uh, asymmetry, incomplete information, hyperbole discounting, or which is related to immediate gratification bias and, uh, and framing. So asymmetric information is uh, um, uh, important to understand privacy decision, decision making because it is endemic and it is powerful. Um, by that I mean that uh, as uh, individuals we often do not have a clear sense of how much data is actually being collected about us and more importantly nowadays even if we may be aware that we are tracked uh, in almost any step we engage in and take online, we may not be a, a aware of the inferences that other entities are able to make about us based on the data that we share, and how these inferences will then be used for decisions which may affect our own uh, uh, welfare. So that's the first crucial factor, which uh, impede uh, uh, or reduce the ability of people to as I was mentioning earlier, make achieved or realized privacy the same as desire privacy. Second problem I was referring to, a second factor, is uh, hyperbole discounting, or in general, the kind of literature that suggests that due to the way, due to the way uh, human beings tend to discount uh, future events and the costs and the benefits associated with them, we may often suffer from immediate gratification bias, which uh, tends to make us favor current benefits, even in the face of uh, downstream cost. And if you think about it, uh, privacy trade-offs are inherently uh, dynamic and intertemporal in nature. Uh, we, 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 we may protect some data now and incur a cost such as uh, we, we, we don't get a, uh, access to a site that was asking the data that we don't want to reveal. And the benefit uh, we receive from, do, from doing so is only a future uh, in time. It's uncertain. Maybe we decrease uh, the future risk of being subject to some uh, negative outcome due to misuse of the data. Whereas by, by reverse, when we share data, we often receive some immediate reward. It could be intangible, it could be tangible, it could be a discount, it could be just a satisfaction of having shared something with others. The potential costs are uncertain because there may be none in future. And, and, and again, when, when, when we face these intertemporal trade-offs, sometimes we tend to benefit and focus on our current self to the detriment of our, our future self. So this creates, again, a challenge uh, for, uh, for privacy protection. Um, and uh, finally, framing. Uh, we, we know from our own research and that of others that how you frame scenarios can have a, a profound influence on uh, uh, consumer decision making. In the case of privacy, we demonstrated that uh, depending on uh, slight changes in uh, framing uh, uh, privacy versus uh, uh, money trade-offs, we can produce very significant changes in uh, uh, consumers' uh, reactions, such as we can make consumers more or less willing to, uh, to give up money to protect their data, depending on subtle changes in framing. And to go back to your original question, um, there is uh, evidence that uh, organizations do use uh, framing to their own advantage uh, by controlling the platform and the interface of the platform. They also become the so-called uh, choice architects, the ones that basically can try to influence very subtly consumer behavior to direct it in, uh, in, 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 um, in certain uh, directions which may be preferable for, for the platform. More user engagement, perhaps more time spent on a site, 
perhaps higher likelihood of disclosing information, perhaps higher likelihood of uh, sharing information with others, perhaps higher likelihood of clicking on an ad, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is, uh, whether this is inherently ethical or unethical per se, is uh, is uh, is uh, an interesting question. As an economist, I try to, uh, and as a behavior economist, I try to focus on uh, when that may be happening and and what consequences it may have. Uh, I, so I do not tackle the ethicality uh, question directly, not because it's not important, in fact, it's very important, but because my focus is, uh, as an empiricist, in trying to find data that can inform the individuals, policymakers, and the public debate uh, at large of when these things may be happening and what kind of implications they may have for, for consumers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To wrap up, what do you think policymakers can learn from this, and and what are the areas that you think require further research? I I do hope uh, the that the central lesson for po policymakers of uh, um, uh, this particular piece the the secrets and likes uh, manuscript uh, is that if if and I stress if we are serious as a society in our attempt or desire to allow individuals to manage our privacy then it seems to us that a almost inevitable conclusion is that privacy regulation is uh, unavoidable is uh, necessary reliance on notice and consent mechanism you know privacy policies and privacy settings is not enough reliance on privacy technologies which i love and i use is not enough in that privacy enhancing technologies can solve many problems and can help us in many situations but once again uh, we believe that we need a regulatory framework to promote the uh, deployment of privacy enhancing technologies um, rather than uh, hoping that the that market forces uh, left alone will actually bring us to an equilibrium where privacy and technologies or other tools uh, ensure that individuals can bring their achieved or realized level of privacy. I was referring to earlier using uh, Irwin Altman's language, close to their desired level of privacy. In essence, I hope that the message for policymakers is uh, the importance of regulatory regulatory intervention in this area. In this area, if as a society we believe that privacy is still important to us. Yeah. Okay. So thank you once again, Professor Christie, for being with us today, and we are looking forward to your future research in this area. And to our viewers, we hope you enjoyed this episode as much as we did. And we'll see you again very soon with another exciting episode of the Center for Law and Economics Vlog and Podcast Series. See you and bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah.